This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We return to Omer Bartov, professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University. The Israeli-American scholar has been described by the U.S. Holocaust Museum as one of the world's leading specialists on genocide. He spoke to us on Wednesday, one day after the House voted to censure Rashida Tlaib, the only Palestinian-American member of Congress, for her criticism of Israel. Professor Bartov, you are a professor at Brown University um, in Providence. You're in Cambridge right now. And I wanted to ask you about the dissent on college campuses and how they're being dealt with. In Cambridge, at Harvard, uh, you know about the students um, who were protesting on behalf of Palestinian rights. A truck carries around their faces, and above their faces it says, um, anti-Semite. Um, and on television, you'll see pieces on anti-Semitism, which is very real in the world. For example, the burning of the uh, Austrian cemetery uh, in Vienna um, and many other situations. But they will be blended together. This is on the mainstream networks, with images of people protesting holding a Palestinian flag. Can you talk about what's happening on college campuses and people fearing that um, their concern for justice is being translated as anti-Semitism and cause for them to be blacklisted? So, look, this is a very uh, complex issue, I agree. Um, I think part of it is, uh, frankly, ignorance about the uh, reality on the ground in Israel-Palestine. And, and that has to do, uh, obviously, not with your show, but with um, uh, much of how the mainstream media uh, in the United States is presenting things. But also, um, young people, students can find other sources of information to better know uh, what is happening on the ground. So generally, I think there's a little bit of, of, of uh, issue of information. Anti-Semitism is real, as you say, and has been growing and is a not just lamentable, but, but, but frightening phenomenon. Um, and, and I obviously have no sympathy with it. Uh, but there is, and there has been for a long time, a tendency to label any criticism of the state of Israel uh, any criticism of the policies of any particular government, uh, let alone criticism of Israel as a state, as such, as anti-Semitism. And that is a policy of the right wing in Israel, and that's a policy of the right wing in, in this country, and it has nothing to do with the truth. One can be a Zionist or a non-Zionist or an anti-Zionist and not be anti-Semitic. One can be uh, uh, and against Zionists, but against particular Israeli policies, I very strongly support the existence of the state of Israel, and I'm highly critical of its policies. And some people would call me a self-hating Jew. Uh, but that is nonsense. That has to do with criticism of policies that not only uh, uh, um, um, function as oppression of Palestinians uh, over a very long period of time, 56 years of occupation of Palestinians, a refusal by the Israeli government to ever talk about what happened in 1948. Uh, so this kind of uh, shutting up the entire conversation, and at the same time, a belief that uh, Jews, like other nations, have a right of self-determination. So we have to separate the two. I think that at the moment, um, in the demonstrations, there, there is a sort of heightening of passions. And in part, it is because of the policies of the Israeli government. Uh, I do feel that when people uh, march uh, uh, in support of Palestinian lives, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of that, one does also have to remember uh, what happened on October 7th. Uh, on October 7th, uh, over a thousand um, um, Jewish civilians, Israeli Jewish civilians, there were actually some Arabs there too, some Bedouin who lived there too, uh, were butchered in the most heinous manner. 
uh, and, and this was live streamed. Uh, this has been deeply wounding to Israeli society. Almost every person in Israel knows people who were killed there or kidnapped, uh, including myself, members of my own family who were either killed or, or are now in Gaza. Uh, and one has to recall that there are 240 people now held as hostages. Um, and so I think that when one protests the policies of Israel, uh, for 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 the sake of and and this has to do also with what uh, Representative Talib said, which I completely agree with. I thought it was a very moving speech, but I think it's important to also stress that other side. There has been a a dehumanization of both sides. Uh, occupation dehumanizes people. It dehumanizes the occupier and it dehumanizes the occupied. And the way to deal with this is to talk about the, the, the political future. How do we move forward? A ceasefire would be wonderful, and I'm very much in support of it, but it won't put an end to the violence. The end to the violence will come only as a result of a peaceful resolution of this 100-year-old conflict, which has cost so much blood. That is, I think, what we should uh, try to push the American administration to do, to change its policies, to put pressure on the Israeli government to finally relent and to begin again negotiations with the Palestinians. And let me ask you about the term from the river to the sea, um, which uh, the Israeli government takes, um, and those who charge others with anti Semitism uh, say uh, it means the annihilation of the Jewish population of Israel. I'm looking at the Likud party platform of March 1977, the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, Eretz Yisrael, which is the land of Israel. And it says the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Israel is eternal and indisputable, and is linked with the right to security and peace. Therefore, Judea and Samaria will not be handed to any foreign administration between the sea and the Jordan. There will only be Israeli sovereignty. That's between the sea and the Jordan River, between the river and the sea. Can you talk about that term? Yes, you know, uh, the, the originators of the Likud party, the revisionist uh, part of, the, of uh, Zionism, um, under the, the great leader Jabotinsky, uh, had a song uh, that, that they used to sing. And the song was, uh, the Jordan has two banks, this one belongs to us and the other one too. Uh, that is, they were not only talking actually about uh, so-called historical Palestine, which is mandatory Palestine uh, of the interwar period, they were actually talking also about parts of the Jordan, uh, of what is now uh, the Kingdom of Jordan as uh, belonging to the future Jewish state. So when we talk about from the Jordan to the sea, uh, we, we are talking about the territory that is now controlled by Israel. In that territory, there are now 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinians. 2 million Palestinians were Israeli citizens, 3 million Palestinians were in the West Bank, and 2 to 2.5 million Palestinians, uh, most of the population of Gaza are refugees um, in, in Gaza. Uh, so it's 7 million versus 7 million. Um, to talk about a Palestinian state or a Jewish state between the Jordan and the sea, the question, of course, arises, so what happened to the, what will happen to the other half? Um, that is really the question. Uh, if one talks about a Palestinian state that refuses to recognize uh, the Jewish right uh, of self-determination, that is, of the right of Jews to have a state of their own, the question is, what would happen to the Jews there? Would they go back to Europe, as some people say, whatever that actually means. And if you have a state the way the Israeli right, the Likud party, and now the much more radical, um, um, really Jewish supremacist elements in uh, Netanyahu's government, the Smotrich and Ben Gvir, these people who sort of trace their roots back to Rabbi Kahana, who, who, who are really Nazis, uh, if you think, if you ask yourself, what do they mean? They want to create a Jewish state that does not have Palestinians in it, no Arabs in it, 
And the policy has been consistently to make life as unbearable for the Palestinians there so that either they will finally move out, which they have no intention of doing, or to use an emergency situation such as exists right now under the cover of which they could be ethnically cleansed. And that's a major worry now among Palestinians who are Israeli citizens who are worried about a second Nakba, a second expulsion of Palestinians after 1948, something that has been mentioned by a number of uh, Israeli politicians, and of course, a major worry in the West Bank and in Gaza. So what we need to think of is not uh, the term from the Jordan to the sea, which is the territory that Israel now controls, but how does that territory get to be shared by these two groups in ways that do not include oppression, lack of any rights, lack of equality, and certainly does not include violence and expulsion. And finally, uh, Professor Omar Bartov, the issue of a two-state solution or one-state solution, if you could take that on in a nutshell. Yes. So, you know, I, I used to be a strong supporter of the two-state solution, and I gradually realized that this was a sort of fig leaf of the Israeli left while um, the country kept settling the West Bank and making it impossible to create an independent uh, Palestinian state there. And we kept saying, well, but at the end, there will be a two-state solution. So the traditional two-state solution, to my mind, is no longer viable. So what is viable? And I think, and I, I belong to a, a, a group of people who've been talking about it uh, for quite a while, uh, that the only solution is a confederation, which would mean that there would be two states, there would be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, they both would have uh, full sovereignty, and they would be along more or less the borders of 1967, um, um, the, the Green Line, so-called, uh, but they would make a distinction between residency and citizenship so that people, say Jews, who live in a Palestinian state could remain Israeli uh, citizens uh, who have rights of residency in a Palestinian state, but have to then uh, adhere to all the laws, rules, and regulations of that Palestinian state. And Palestinians who live, say, in Nablus and would like to live in Haifa, like a Frenchman from Paris who would like to live in Berlin, could move to Haifa, and they could have rights of residency, uh, but they'd have to conform to all the rules and regulations of the Israeli state, but they would vote for uh, to a, a, a Palestinian parliament. And Jerusalem would be the joint capital of both. Uh, and above that, there would be institutions that would take care of the mutual affairs of these two states, which are very tightly woven together now by their infrastructure, electricity, um, uh, water, and so forth. It's really impossible to cut them apart. That is right now, of course, sounds like a pipe dream, but I think that in the long run, that is probably the only viable solution. And I'll add one last thing to that, which is very important both to Jews and Palestinians, which is that both states would have the right of return. The Jews could say, as they say now, that Jews who want to become Israeli citizens wherever they live can come. And Palestinians in the Palestinian state could say all Palestinian refugees who would like to come back to Palestine could come and become Palestinian citizens and under certain rules could also move to the Israeli part of so-called mandatory Palestine as residents. And why not simply a one-state solution? I think a one-state solution is something that neither one side nor the other wants, because the Palestinians quite rightly want the right of self-determination, want to have their own state, as do the Jews. And both sides are afraid that the other side would be more powerful. Obviously, uh, right now, under current conditions, uh, the, uh, the state of Israel is much more powerful uh, militarily, economically, uh, than the Palestinian part of, of 
of the land. And so in that sense, a one-state solution would actually perpetuate um, uh, Jewish supremacy in the whole country. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.